For almost 70 years, the Soviet Union was a superpower that was virtually unmatched when it came to mechanical might. They invested in many experimental designs to prove their power to the world, but some vehicles that emerged from the socialist state were jaw-dropping, but for all the wrong reasons. From fortresses with wings to screw-propelled trucks and even flying saucers, no Soviet design was too much or too mad. So buckle up and brace yourselves, because we're about to take a look at some of the craziest Soviet vehicles that you won't believe are real. The 2B1 Oka in the Soviet Union, the idea of bigger is always better was made pretty clear from the creation of the 2B1 Oka. This very, uh, <laughs> well-endowed experimental artillery model was designed back in 1957, just as the Cold War was beginning to heat up. America had recently rolled out their atomic Annie mortar, which fired huge 280mm atomic shells, making it a wagon that could shoot relatively small nuclear bombs. In retaliation, the Soviet military developed two self-propelled nuclear artillery systems of their own. And as you probably guessed, one of them was the utterly insane 2B1 Oka. The barrel of this cannon was a horrifying 65 feet long. For contrast, an entire Sherman tank is just 20 feet long. At this staggering size, the barrel could fire 420 millimeter rounds that weighed a colossal 1,650 pounds apiece and could land an atomic explosion 28 miles away. Unfortunately for the Oka, its huge gun was also a huge problem. With rounds that weighed more than a grand piano, the cannon's laborious loading process meant the Oka could only fire once every five minutes. On top of that, the recoil of the colossal cannon was too much for the rest of the vehicle to endure. The steely chassis was damaged with every shot and would even rip the gearbox from its mountings. Thankfully, this insane design was abandoned in the 1960s when big guns made way for big missiles. But even though it was never used in combat, I bet just rolling it out was enough to give Soviet enemies a real good scare. The 1K17 Shatya if sci-fi movies are anything to go by, the battlefields of the future will have lasers flying in every direction. And while modern militaries are developing laser technology, there's one Soviet vehicle that's already built for a futuristic laser fight. This is the 1K17 Shatya, also known as the Soviet laser tank. It was developed back in the 1970s, although it wasn't built to burn holes through the enemy. The array of 13 lasers on top of the tank chassis focused a powerful light source through synthetically grown rubies, with each one weighing a staggering 66 pounds. When the array was fired in pulses, the Shatya could destroy the optical sensors on enemy vehicles and missiles and even cause immediate blindness when fired at enemy troops. Now that's what I call ultimate laser tag. But this otherworldly weapon never entered service for a number of very good reasons. Firstly, rubies that are heavier than a large microwave oven are not cheap to produce. And secondly, it would have violated the Geneva Convention's protocol on blinding laser weapons if it was ever used in an anti-infantry role. Like war wasn't bad enough, using this would have landed them with a lot of powerful enemies. So it's a good thing that when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, any plans of mass laser tank production fell with it. Okay, I want to do a quick poll. If you had the choice between a 65-foot gun of the Oka or the lasers of the Geneva Convention breaking Shatya, which would you rather fire? For the enormous Oka, hit that like button. And for the blinding Shatya, set your sights on that subscribe button. Can't choose? Then hit both. Alright, now where were we? The Sveno Project In the 1930s, a little over a decade since the end of the First World War, Soviet Russia realized that the skies would be the battlegrounds of the future. So it began developing experimental aircraft just in case a Second World War started. Spoiler alert, it did. 
Now, Russia was ready to take to the air, but one of the vehicles they created looked more like a flying circus than a military machine. The Svenno Project, also called the Chain Link Project, involved a bomber that had been specially modified not to carry bombs, but smaller fighter planes. It was an out-of-the-box plan to save fuel on the front lines, as bombers were much more fuel efficient than the smaller fighters. After takeoff, the fighters docked with the carrier while in flight by using some special fastenings. And once they were all strapped down, the bomber flew them off into the fight and refueled them on the way. Each of these amazing motherships could carry up to five fighters, and each fighter was loaded up with around 1,000 pounds of bombs. So if you saw one of these things on the horizon, you knew you were in for a whole swarm of trouble. Even though these creative craft were used successfully at the beginning of World War II, the Svenno project wasn't developed any further. During the wartime technology boom, these aircraft quickly became obsolete and were replaced by state-of-the-art fighter jets. Well, the design didn't fly with the military, but I wonder if the project found a home in the Soviet circus scene. The Antonov A-40 the Soviets may have given up on that fortified flying circus, but they were far from done with crazy aircraft designs. Don't believe me? Then just feast your eyes on the unbelievable Antonov A-40. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's a tank with wings. This astonishing Soviet prototype was built almost 80 years ago to determine if gliding a tank straight onto a battlefield was possible. At the time, the Soviets were testing whether bombers could be used to drop tanks into position mid-battle. Some of these tests even plunged the tanks into bodies of water to see what damage they sustained on impact. But in 1942, Soviet glider designer Oleg Antonov took the idea one step further. He created a detachable cradle made up of biplane wings and a twin tail that could be attached onto the chassis of a light tank. The A-40 would then be towed behind a bomber and released, gliding into enemy territory where it could shed its wings and fight as a standard tank. However, during the A-40's maiden flight, the bomber towing it was forced to drop it early because of the incredible amount of drag the tank generated. It was more like an anchor than an aircraft. Even though the tank and its driver managed to survive the fall, the project didn't. It was, ironically, dropped in favor of a more conventional weapons system. Much to the relief of that poor tank driver, I'm sure. The Milmi-10 now, when the Soviet military wanted some seriously heavy lifting done, they called in a Milmi-10 helicopter. Despite looking like the love child of a helicopter and a spider, the long legs on this chopper weren't for climbing up buildings or weaving webs between the clouds. It was designed in the late 1950s to carry big, bulky loads that the Union's largest helicopters at the time, the Milmi-6, couldn't fit in its hold. While the Mi-6 could carry a little over 13 tons, the M-10's lighter design and external platform allowed it to load up to 15 tons of oddly shaped equipment. With those long, gangly legs making it almost 30 feet high, the chopper could taxi over its loads, attach them to its fuselage, and fly off with everything in tow. This ranged from trucks and buses to fully built buildings. It was such a strange and shocking sight to behold that the Mi-10 was featured in demonstrations and air shows all over the world to show off its unique feature. Even though mass production of this wacky flying crane design didn't take off, 55 Mi-10s were produced during the 1960s and some were still in use up to 2013. I guess a good set of legs never really goes out of style. The K-84 Yekaterinburg from the 1950s through to 1997, the Soviet Union and later Russia built a total of 245 nuclear-powered submarines. This was more than all other nations combined, but the Soviet submarine obsession almost caused one of the worst nuclear disasters in history. In 2011, the nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine K-84, also known as Yekaterinburg, made a quick stop in a dry dock. Built in 1982, the almost 550-foot-long sub was powered by two nuclear reactors and could carry up to 16 nuclear missiles. 
But during some routine welding work, a fatal fire broke out along the wooden scaffolding surrounding its bow. This quickly spread to the submarine itself, and for a whole heart-stopping day, firefighters struggled to control the blaze. The sub had been carrying just four nuclear missiles at the time, but if it had exploded, it would have caused a nuclear accident comparable to the infamous Chernobyl meltdown. As catastrophic as it could have been, the K-84 was gradually repaired, exposing the sheer size of the sub's sonar array. It may be a nuclear death trap, but does anyone else think it looks like that cool ship from the Disney film Atlantis? Though it looks like something out of a sci-fi adventure, that big bulb is actually the sonar array's acoustic chamber. This is used to analyze sound waves from sonar equipment and translate it into visual data so that the sub can navigate underwater. As cool as it looks, this chamber was filled with a highly flammable liquid that almost ignited during the incident. I don't know what's crazier, the fact that these subs are practically bombs made out of bombs, or that the Soviets once had 245 of them. The M15 Belfegor Often referred to as the ugliest plane in the world, the M15 Belfegor certainly isn't the prettiest aircraft to look at. Hailing from the Soviet satellite state of Poland, this government-designed crop duster was meant to replace the old reliable Antu biplane, but the M15 was not what anyone in their right mind would call an improvement. Like the Antu, the Belvigor was also a biplane, but its design traded a propeller-based turboprop engine for a turbofan-based jet engine. These powerful engines are intended for aircraft that need to reach high speeds, so using one in an agricultural aircraft was a weird world first. Despite this, it was able to carry up to three tons of pesticides in the huge pylons separating its wings. So the Soviet bloc had huge expectations for the plane. But in reality, the design was a disaster. For a start, it had a maximum range of just 215 nautical miles, half that of the On-2. The jet engine was also more difficult to fix than a turboprop, and it cost much more to build and operate. And to top it off, the funky fuselage design limited the Belfigur's usefulness to crop dusting. In other words, this plane was a strange, high-maintenance, and expensive one-trick pony. While the Union had plans to make thousands of them, production of this Polish plane was pigeonholed in 1981. Thank God. The Loon Class Ikranoplan One of the most unusual vehicles from the time of the Cold War, or any era for that matter, has to be the Loon Class Ikranoplan. At a gargantuan 242 feet long with a wingspan of 144 feet, this bizarre beast could only just fit inside the lines of a standard American football field. You may think, with all those wings and jet engines, that it's some sort of Soviet aircraft. But this amazing machine is actually a boat-plane hybrid. Instead of taking to the skies or chugging across the seas, the Ekronoplan exploits something called the wing-in-ground effect. As it flies closer to the ground, air pressure builds between its specially shaped wings and the surface below. This creates a cushion of air beneath the plane, allowing the entire vehicle to float just inches over the surface of a lake or ocean. And by mounting eight turbojet engines to the front, this behemoth could travel at a terrifying top speed of 340 miles per hour. Not only that, but its sheer size meant it could carry upwards of 110 tons, so it had the capacity of a ship with all the speed of an aircraft. On top of that, can you see those six twinned cylinders lining its top? Those aren't party poppers, they're missile launchers. With all that speed and firepower, these monsters were designed to take out any incoming U.S. aircraft carriers intruding in Union waters. One prototype entered military service in 1987, but when the Soviet regime crumbled four years later, this low-flying hybrid was left to gather dust. Although, if Russia ever needed to fight against a big ol' sea monster, I think I know which machine they'd bring out of retirement. Project Ekip As much as I hate to admit it, the tin-hat-loving conspiracy theorists are right. 
UFOs do exist, but they don't come from outer space, they come from Soviet Russia. Say hello to the EKIP, the Soviet aircraft that looks like it was made on Mars. Conceptualized back in 1978, this Russian flying saucer didn't resemble any other plane of its time, or our time, come to think of it. Its striking domed design was based on aircraft that didn't have any distinguishable fuselage like certain stealth bombers and reconnaissance aircraft. The elliptical shape acted like one big wing, and with its turbojet engine, this strange saucer could rely on air cushion technology to take off and land, just like the Ekranoplan. This meant it could take off from the ground as well as from the water. It was a truly alien concept, but an all-terrain aircraft was obviously appealing to the Soviet Union's military, no matter what it looked like. As the prototypes were being developed, engineers estimated that this highly aerodynamic design would only use 14 grams of fuel per passenger kilometer. For contrast, regular planes at the time used 45 grams of fuel per passenger kilometer and the commercial implications this had were huge. So larger models, like the L3, were designed to carry up to 400 passengers, and others would even be able to carry passengers alongside their cars. But its fate, like so many other crazy Soviet vehicles, was bound to the demise of the Union. The EKIP program ground to a halt and, sadly, never took off. But if it had, could you imagine what our airports would look like today? I'd take a trip on a UFO over an economy seat any day. The Baratini Bari VVA-14 A lot of these experimental Soviet vehicles look like they've been plucked straight out of sci-fi films, but the Baratini Bari VVA-14 might just have inspired one. It closely resembles Star Wars' famous Millennium Falcon, but it was created in 1972, almost five years before Star Wars hit the silver screen. Looks like George Lucas has some serious explaining to do. The VVA stands for Verticalno Vizileta Yuschea Amphibia, or Vertical Tankoff Amphibious Aircraft if you're not fluent in Russian, like me. Like its title suggests, it could take off from the water and fly at altitudes of up to 33,000 feet, but it could also fly just a few feet over the ocean waves, using that previously mentioned wing-in-ground effect. It achieved this thanks to two large pods you can see connected to the fuselage. The two engines at the front create a cushion of air by directing the exhaust into narrow channels between the fuselage and the pods allowing the plane to skirt over the waves. It needed this sea-skirting ability to destroy the USA's Polaris submarine missiles, which kept the Soviet Union awake at night during the Cold War. Initially, the VVA-14 was designed with 12 lift engines for vertical takeoff and landing abilities, but these were never installed. And after its designer passed away in 1974, this project hit a wall. The two prototypes that were built were retired in 1987, although their legacy clearly lives on in the Star Wars franchise. The ZVM-2901 All-terrain vehicles are designed to conquer everything off-road. With huge wheels or caterpillar tracks, they can make quick work of any type of terrain and look incredibly cool doing so. But back in the 1970s, in an effort to think outside the box, Soviet Russia's engineers brought the strangely screw-propelled ZVM-2901 to the table. They'd fused the cab from a UAZ-452 van with two huge hollow screw drives, the blades of which dug into the terrain and propelled the vehicle over it. The result was a vehicle that could plow through thick swamps, miles of mud, and even float over the water. Even though it was practically unstoppable, using screws cost the vehicle its speed. With a 152 horsepower engine, it could make it to just 15 miles per hour and cruising through the water brought that down to just 6 miles per hour. It had been based on similar screw-propelled designs from history, like Chrysler's Marsh Screw Amphibian, which was abandoned because of those laughably low top speeds. That didn't deter Soviet Russia from taking a stab at it, though. While the experimental design was incredibly eye-catching, vehicle speeds and applications of tracked and tired vehicles were vastly superior. And so, this screwy design was left in the past.
The Carlinian K-7 Today, planes with wings spanning hundreds of feet are pretty common. All you have to do is look up and you'll see a commercial liner like a Boeing 747 with wings stretching out around 200 feet. But back in the 1930s, just 30 years after the Wright brothers proved that man could fly, Soviet Russia wheeled out the mega monstrosity that was the Kalinian K-7. It had a wingspan of more than 170 feet and a wing area of almost 5,000 square feet, which is bigger than that of a B-52 bomber. It was initially going to be powered by seven propeller engines, with six along its wings and one planted at its rear. But as it was being built, it exceeded its maximum takeoff weight and two more engines had to be added along the wing. Once constructed, the almost 27-ton flying fortress was the largest plane in the world. But depending on its configuration, it could be used for different missions, such as troop transport or as a gunship or a bomber. So it would have had the capacity to carry up to 120 people or around 21 tons of bombs. Unfortunately, though, it never made it into battle. The principles of flight the K-7 grappled with were just too advanced for the technology of the time, and the only prototype disastrously crashed and burned during testing. While the Soviets get points for testing out such a bold idea, this flying fortress was definitely a flying failure. The Tsar Tank now, this next machine may not have been Soviet, but you can definitely tell it was made by Russia. In the middle of World War I, Russian engineers decided to build a tank the height of a three-story house with guns that could obliterate an entire forest. The large front wheels were 30 feet in diameter, and its main body stretched back almost 60 feet to connect to a single rear wheel. Two turrets full of cannons and machine guns were bolted on top and underneath the raised carriage. And to add the cherry on top, additional machine guns lined the armored pods on each side of the wheels to protect the tank from infantry. This was clearly the king of all tanks, and so they aptly named it the Tsar Tank. But what mad idea inspired this colossal design? At the time, the Russians were looking for a way to break through the Eastern Front trench system. Instead of tanks with traditional tracks, they decided to experiment with massive spoked wheels. However, this 60-ton steel behemoth wasn't designed to be on the battlefield. Thanks to some bad engineering, that small rear wheel bore too much of the tank's enormous weight and was prone to getting stuck in soft ground and ditches. Then, during its testing phase, it got embarrassingly stuck in a field and couldn't be dug out. The Tsar tank remained rusting there throughout the war until it was finally scrapped in 1923. Now that was one wheelie big waste. The Evolution of Maz Trucks Way back in 1954, the Minsk Auto Savad, abbreviated to Maz, was founded in Soviet-ruled Minsk. This factory produced some of the most reliable and diverse tractors of the Soviet market, often turning the vehicles into all-terrain trucks that could carry massive loads, like the Maz 529. This uniaxial engine could tow up to 34 tons of just about anything, from cement mixers to ice rinks. This caught the attention of the Soviet military, who commissioned the factory's first biaxial vehicle, the Maz 535. And this 8x8 beast of a tractor didn't spread manure, it spread munitions. At almost 30 feet long and 10 feet wide, it could carry up to 8 tons, meaning it could tow anything from tanks to massive missiles. But this wasn't Maz's final form. As the Soviet Union began making bigger ballistic missiles in the 1960s, the Maz 543 was created to carry them. As you can see, the front cabin was split into two, though it was only driven from the left compartment. The divot this left in the middle of the truck allowed it to horizontally carry sensitive loads that weighed up to 15 tons. Although, they didn't stop there. As the size of the rockets increased, so did the Maz, leading to the creation of the astonishing 12x12 12 12 Maz 547. This six-axle truck could carry a staggering 62-ton payload 
and with its 625 horsepower engine, could move at a top speed of 24 miles per hour. But then, somehow, the rockets got even bigger, and so did the Maz. The next successor, the Maz 7904, was a whopping 100 feet long, 20 feet wide, and could carry missiles weighing a terrifying 200 tons. Whoa, those cabins are so far apart that this truck is starting to resemble that sloth from Ice Age. But did they stop there? Of course not. Meet the jaw-dropping 24 by 24 wheel 12 axle Maz 7907. This monstrous machine was designed to carry the Zelina 2 missiles, which were going to weigh over 100 tons and measure in at a staggering 74 feet long. That's almost the same size as a six-story building. Unfortunately, the Soviet Union collapsed before the project could launch, and only a few prototype 7907s were made. This was the end of the road for the mad military Maz designs, but what a wild and wheelie ride it was. Which of these Soviet vehicles did you think was the most insane? Or have you seen any of them in museums with your own eyes? Let me know down in the comments below, and thanks for watching.